Good afternoon, good evening, Danvers. Uh, this is Mark Zuberek speaking for the Topics of the Town News, and I have Mr. John Toomey with me today. Good afternoon, John. Howdy. And, and as you see, I'm still in my summer attire, and you're already into the fall with long <laughs> sleeves. So welcome, John. I appreciate you coming and uh, co-hosting the show. Great to be aboard. I will start with the uh, updates of the Selectman's meeting, but I just want to give you an idea of what other segments we have. Segment one will be resident concerns regarding the Beverly Airport expansion, outpouring of noise complaints. Segment two, will be resident concerns regarding the Danvers School Department and specifically the school committee. Segment three, if we get to it, is in regard to resident concerns regarding the Department of Public Utilities and specifically citizens' petition on the spending of the Municipal Light Board. So, I just want to let everybody know that uh, the agenda and opinions are solely by the topics of the town news host and commentators. What I like to do is introduce the show with one famous saying from Mark Twain. And if we can show that, David, that'll be great. But it, what it says, it's easier to fool people than to convince them that they have been fooled. This was a very good quote from Mark Twain years and years ago, and we're repeating that right now in our own uh, environment in town, state, and federal government. So the current notes from the select board, uh, there were some resident concerns regarding the zoning expansion outpouring of development complaints. One of the things that I noticed, John, is that the current zoning for the downtown area that was passed in 2018, I believe, they're having concerns in regard that the developers are not complying with it and they're not living up to the zoning requirements. Now, you, you live downtown. Yeah. And the thing that uh, sort of concerned several of the selectmen, and specifically Matthew Duggan, that the current plans that are being presented to the planning board uh, in regard to the hot watt area development and the grocery store and, and that whole area on, on um, Hobart Street uh, are not being attended by residents that should have some concerns in regard to this. So do you have any concerns that, that may get to you? Because the only thing that I know of is that there's supposed to be meetings that are being held by the planning board and they're not uh, being attended very well. Well, this is the problem is that the public in general, uh, and especially the voters in Davis, are not participating. Uh, it just, it, it's ridiculous. They don't vote in the elections. They're not going to the uh, meetings that the various boards have. Uh, they're not, uh, as I say, they're not participating. They're not getting their opinions across. The uh, end result is that we have the town and the town is run very well, uh, I, I, my personal opinion. But it's run by a very small group of people. Right. And whether or not uh, it, it gets well done uh, is a factor that it depends upon what you consider well done. Uh, do the people, do the voters, do the residents of Danvers uh, have a, a, any any uh, uh, control yeah. over what's going on and what will happen. 
So uh, when they don't show up at any of these meetings and they don't participate, they don't vote, uh, no, they don't have a, a, any input into what's going on. And, uh, and, and the announcements of these meetings are not very well publicized, especially in this environment that we're in because the town planning board and the town itself is posting everything on the internet. And not many people go in to find out what the meetings are and wh when these meetings are held. And they're held at various hours of the day. I just saw a, a meeting notice for 10 o'clock in the morning by the planning board. Who is going to attend that? They should come back to a scheduled meeting. Now, there was also a, um, a presentation made by the planning department in regards to the uh, public uh, revisions that are being planned to the zoning downtown and in other areas. And what they announced is that there is a meeting scheduled for, to, for the public input uh, for September 14th. So that's something that if we're interested, we should go to that and uh, get an idea. Do you of know where what, it is? No, I, I don't have any announcement okay. yet. All they did is uh, basically uh, announce the meeting for September 14th. 14th. But who knows where they're going to hold it? Probably at the Toomey Room. So the other uh, items that I noticed on the agenda and the discussion that was taking place was the train station. <laughs> the train station all over again. That train station has been an item of uh, discussion for the last 20-some years. Uh, the one thing that was presented, and I don't know if you have anything to say about that, John, but uh, you've been in town forever. And what do you think of that train station? I mean, you well, know. It, it's too bad. Uh, it, it's a symbol, as far as I'm concerned, of, of what was. And it, we should carry it forward. We should. Uh, present it to the public in general as to what was back then. And it, 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 it's, it's from the 1860s, so this is the last train station that's left in Danvers, and there used to be nine, I believe. Well, now, I, I, I live uh, the past, what, 40 years uh, right off the railroad tracks, and uh, it was a, a, a very interesting situation. My kids grew up waving at the uh, engineers driving the train down. Uh, and it was this, this was part of their life. It, uh, that used to be right behind your house, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it's, as I say, it, it was part of their life. And, and they still remember it to this day. But this... Well, I, I, I don't know what to con uh, compare it to, but it, it, it's, it's something that they remember and we should pass it on. That's right. The memories, we should pass it on to the future, uh, what Danvers was like and what happened during the, the period that all this was going on. It's very interesting, the uh, railroad... Uh, stories uh, and uh, the history of the railroad in Danvers. And it, it was fascinating. Well, the disappointing part about what was uh, discussed at the selectmen's meeting is the train station. Uh, the proposal was made to preserve it but at a cost of $1.2 million, I believe. And what the historians and the uh, one selectman that had courage to bring it up, uh, Matthew Duggan brought up a, this uh, motion to proceed and develop a warrant article for the town meeting to consider whether to fund it or not to fund it. Because right now, 
they have no uh, donations or uh, outside funds that have been allocated towards the preservation of the Well, of they, the have, they have no program seeking funds. Well, that's absolutely right. And, and one of the things that David Mills brought up is why don't we call our, you know, billionaires that are out there um, and see if they would somehow uh, donate money to preserve this so it wouldn't be on the taxpayer's dollar. Well, that's another factor of uh, the residents of Danvers' non-participation. Right. Uh, they just don't get involved in anything. So th there have been many attempts since uh, 2000 and even in 1995. Uh, Townsend Oil, Townsend Family, has been gracious enough to keep that station in that location for all this time. And they are, well, they're going to have to move it, whether it goes in one piece or in pieces. But the, the one thing that was disappointing is that Matthew Duggan, one of the selectmen, has made this proposal and he did not even get a second for discussion of the proposal. So the, the, the board currently does not have the courage to even discuss this issue. Now there have been private citizens in the past that have been interested in preserving that uh, uh, train station and they have basically been, you know, brushed aside that, you know, you don't have any funds. Well, we had funds that were made available to us from the State Preservation Fund at one time, and we squandered the opportunity. Now we are looking for somehow to preserve this, and I, I believe that the way to preserve this is to get a citizen's petition by the interested parties that wanted to preserve it and send it to the Board of Selectmen because they don't have the courage to even discuss it. Well, I, I think it should uh, go before the town meeting and uh, get an opinion. Absolutely, and if the town meeting decides not to fund it, so be it. Hmm. So, the next item that I found uh, during my viewing of the Selectmen's meeting is that we have to send our congratulations to both the new fire chief and the police chief. And I, ha I have an uh, invitation here, swearing in ceremony for the uh, Danvers police chief, but it, it's, uh, it was held on Thursday, September 2nd, and nobody was notified about it. So I don't know how this happens, but one thing that I am happy about is that good to see that promotions are from within the departments. These are people that have lived here, worked here, and love the town for what it is. And it is no longer a small town, it's a small city. So welcome to the police chief and the fire chief, and good, uh, you know, um, uh, prosperous years that are coming ahead of you. Uh, the one thing that I noticed is that the board meetings, the selectmen board meetings, are now at various times of the day, 5 o'clock, 5.30, 6 o'clock, instead of the regular 7 p.m. when people can attend and v participate in their meetings. So that's another thing that needs to be fixed because 7 p.m. has been the historic time. Uh, library has a new director, Noelle Bach, and she has been on the job now for two or three weeks, I believe. And we're going to do a little walk through the library with the new director and see how things are shaping up. Senior Center requires masks now 
for the health board by the uh, per as per the health board and the town manager direction to all town buildings. I attended the health board meeting and I attended the school committee meeting and there were no statistical information from the Board of Health or from the health department. They couldn't answer questions that have been raised. Why are we imposing these restrictions on our senior citizens? Most of them are vaccinated. So why is this control continuing? And this goes back to my original Mark Twain quote that it's easier to fool someone than to convince them that they have been fooled. But wearing masks is supposedly prevents spreading of the disease. The, according to the published information in regards to masks, they do not serve the purpose. It all depends on wh where you're getting your information, whether it's false or correct or just plain opinion. Well, it's not opinion. This, this is published information. <laughs> but there's still... Uh, that doesn't mean anything. Well, I am convinced that uh, masks do not serve the purpose that they're intended if for. If they don't, why are they being pushed so much? That's the question. Why are they being pushed? Well, obviously the people who are in control believe that they work. People in control... Where these are uh, bureaucrats that are in the health department, the state house, and the federal government. They're in control. They're in control. That's right. Now we need to vote them out. <laughs> That's the key. Now, the last item that I have on this is uh, on September 11th. And, and if you notice, I have a decap, decat uh, coffee cup. And it is intended for advertising of DCAT. So thank you very much for viewing. On September 11th, there will be a firehouse, there will be a ceremony for 9-11 at the firehouse on, this is a Saturday, I believe. So just wanted to let everybody know that they're going to, uh, you know, um, ring the bell and uh, the whole ceremony that happens every year. So on September 11th. Now, John, you had an item in regards to the health department, and that's another thing that they have been talking about when I went to the meeting. And again, I was the only one at the meeting. <laughs> they were talking between themselves only. Well, the public just isn't interested. And that basically, to me, that's the biggest problem we have countrywide. Massachusetts wide, Dallas wide. The people have to get out and get their opinions across. But anyway, uh, if you uh, haven't heard of this, I thought this was rather interesting. The uh, West Nile virus uh, is, it comes from mosquitoes. And the Massachusetts Department of Public Health has discovered here in various water spots and Danvers, that the mosquito with the West Nile virus on it is here in Danvers. So they've come out with some recommendations. Um, I, I have to admit, I chuckled when I read these things. Uh, it's a dawn to dusk situation. These mosquitoes will bite like any other mosquito. And it's when the sun rises, the sunset, and they recommend that you use uh, insect repellent, uh, wear long sleeve shirts and long pants and socks. In other words, cover yourself up. Uh, and this is a recommendation in the middle of summer in the hottest weather. Uh, it just, uh, I, I, when I walk around town, it's noticeable how seldom I do see people with long pants and long, uh, long sleeve shirts. Uh, 
Well, we're still in some aware. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's when this mosquito is out. So. That's right. Well, one of the things that was discussed at the uh, Board of Health uh, and uh, Dr. McLaughlin is the head of the Board of Health, and I raised the question too. If we have uh, West Nile virus in town, and at that time, on September 2nd, they did not have it, so it was a few days later that it came about. But I asked the question, we used to have the spraying of some of the neighborhoods because some neighborhoods are infested with uh, mosquitoes because of uh, groundwater or puddles of water in the wetlands that we have around here. And they didn't know that this was happening in the past. Now, we had issues with that, but the melathion that they're using now in the spray, there are uh, private contractors that will do the spraying for you, but the town should be doing that. Yeah, the but the town didn't know it because the state just picked it up recently. Well, so the, the, the that thing, information has to get across. But you see, it takes weeks for them to even identify it and then they, they're probably not going to spray because people are afraid of the, you know, the spray that's happening. So, but it's done and we have to keep an eye on it and, uh, like you said, use bug spray, bug juice, I call it. So, thank you very much, John. That was uh, one item that we wanted to get off the list. Now what we'll do is we'll get into segment number one, and we're going to run out of time, so we're probably going to do two segments today. Resident concerns regarding the Beverly Airport expansion, outpouring of noise complaints. I did an entire show two weeks ago in regard to the Beverly Airport, but i like to just introduce another angle to this. Beverly Regional Airport was built in 1928 through the efforts of the Beverly Aero Club and the Beverly Chamber of Commerce. The U.S. Navy operated the airport during World War II under a joint-use agreement as Navy Auxiliary Air Facility in Beverly. It was commissioned on 15 May 1943, and the airfield was upgraded with a new asphalt runway. The Navy built the control tower, a barracks, and other structures consisted of four officers and 60 enlisted men at that time. It was decommissioned as a military facility on August 1, 1945. Ownership of the airport was transferred back to City of Beverly in 1950. The current Beverly Regional Airport covers an area of 470 acres and an elevation of 107 feet above mean sea level. Now, John brought up some very interesting uh, recollections of your childhood and your uh, participation with the Beverly Airport. Beverly Airport has 170 acres of that property is located in the town of Danvers. So, you as a teenager were, was uh, participating at the airport at that time because it was a recreational activity and you worked there, right? Well, uh, I really didn't work there as such. Uh, David, we can we, show the pictures. Yeah, here we are. As you can see, the tower. And I don't know if that's a Piper or uh, a Ronka. That's an Air Force plane. Uh, well, it's got the symbol, but uh, I don't know if it's Civil Air Patrol or Air Force or what. But uh, this goes back to uh, where, ta where I'll be talking about 1993, uh, I'm sorry, 1953, 1954. Uh, it was a, a a real interesting, uh, I was in uh, what, high school, uh, I joined the Civil Air Patrol uh, over in Beverly Airport, and it was quite fantastic. Uh, it was 
we all, all of us kids more or less grew up in the Second World War so that we were, you know, right. you wore, wore a uniform or anything. Uh, that was a big deal. Next and picture, John, uh, David? Most of us wanted to be pilots. I mean, that was there a big go. thing. Uh, uh, That's a military plane, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, it, it, uh, uh, I'm not sure what it was, but... Uh, well, it doesn't matter, I, I, but I, it's, it's a fighter. These, it's, no, there wasn't a fighter. No? No, that's a, that's a trainer. Or, oh, a trainer. Uh, recon, uh, reconnaissance. Uh, uh, it could be ma many things, but uh, it's, it's not a fighter. Well, anyway, um, in my experience, uh, and here there we you are, go. I'm on the left. I'm not sure who's on the right. Uh, but that was Civil Air Patrol, Civil right? Air Patrol, yeah. Right. It, this was a young, this was, well, I don't want to say it, but it was, it was an organization like the Boy Scouts only. It was a military organization. Uh, I wound up being a sergeant. Uh, what, my age was, what, 15, 16 years old? Wow. <laughs> Next uh, picture. It, uh, oh. And then, now, those are private planes, right? Now, you notice every one of these aircraft and these pictures, and these, I just want to specify these pictures. Uh, I don't know much detail. Uh, uh, I, I can't guarantee uh, anything with the pictures. That, uh, I have them. Uh, I recognize some of the people in them. Uh, the fr what the first picture did show the tower over there, and uh, but and most of these planes are propeller-driven uh, well, gasoline well uh, that's, engines. That's the big thing. Uh, back then, uh, jets were the the future. Uh, it uh, it just wasn't wasn't what uh, very practical uh, because there, there just weren't any. Uh, we. I can't remember ever seeing a jet when I was a kid, uh, and we went all over the place in the Civil right. Air Patrol. Uh, some beautiful, here's a three-wheeler, uh, Eastern Aviation, uh, fantastic. That was but, one of the hangars at the time? Yeah. Well, uh, I'd like to st just say something about the, uh, as I understand it, uh, there are, uh, for the expansion of the airport, there are three possibilities uh, that they talk about. Beverly to New York City, uh, regular uh, and back. Uh, regular schedule, more or less airlines, back and forth. Uh, the second one is Beverly to the Cape uh, and Boston and back. Uh, and whether it's going to be scheduled or not, or uh, as uh, needed, that would be the thing. And here's a good view of the uh, airport and the various types of aircraft. As you can see, uh, they're all propeller driven. Uh, okay, next, next picture. Oh, here you go. That's the <laughs> part of the, uh, not the part of the tower, is it? No. No, I, 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 I don't remember what in the world that was, but it, it was sort of like a tower, control tower. Uh, to me, private flying, uh, which was the big thing back then, uh, has more or less lost the, the public interest. Uh, jets took it over, mainly because of flying now because as a transportation situation. Uh, you want to go somewhere, uh, you fly. Uh, you want to be a tourist, you fly. Uh, it's, uh, it's all over the world and you can fly, and it's all jets. Next yeah. picture, David. There you go. There's another view from the cockpit. And there's a uh, biplane, and uh, uh, but it, it it gives you an idea of uh, it's all flat land. Uh, okay. Next picture, David. Uh, relax. Oh, okay. Relax. That's it. Why? That's the last one. Oh, okay. Uh, the uh, over the years, the, the situation has become quite 
uh, different. Uh, transportation created uh, a business, large business, a worldwide business, and Boston Airport became substantially uh, big. Uh, and private filing has lost the public interest, and jets took it over. Uh, and this resulted in a substantial uh, reduction in the number of aircraft flying in and out of Beverly Airport. Uh, and basically, uh, because of this, the uh, public has lost its interest in, in individual flying. And the future, according to the airport commission, uh, will be a substantial increase in the number of commercial jet traffic into the airport under their proposals. Uh, and you can imagine what the noise is going to be like. When I was a kid, there was a substantial amount of aircraft propeller driven out of Beverly Airport. And it was a constant noise theme. And, but you got used to it. With jets, I don't think you can get used to it. And we're uh, going to go back to that, I think, be, uh, with the situation of if they bring in all this commercial airliners. Um, and I think this is another example of the public not getting involved. There are three different towns that have uh, airport commissions and they should be uh, con uh, conversing with the airport on the proposals for the transportation uh, situation, but they don't seem to be. Um, John, I, currently the airport commission at Beverly Airport is consists of seven individuals. Five are from Beverly, appointed by the mayor, and two are Danvers supposedly is supposed to be Danvers residents, and they are uh, very lax in enforcing the, uh, uh, the noise uh, factor that, that has been happening. Well, people aren't interested. They're not well, getting involved. I mean, even the ones, the few that are saying something and going to uh, any meeting or something, uh, the numbers are so small, nobody's paying attention to them. Uh, well, one of the things that I've noticed is that people are in the process of uh, selling their properties that are in the path of the runway that comes out of uh, Beverly. Well, that's something that, uh, uh, let me bring this up. When you fly out of the airport, when you fly out of any airport, uh, it, it's like a box. You're within a box. You have regulations. You take off and you go at a certain distance at a certain height. And depending upon circumstances, the type of aircraft you have and so forth, uh, you could go left, you go right, you go to 5,000 feet, you go to 10,000 feet. And it's all regulated and it's very uh, enforced. Uh, here in Danvers, we have Beverly, flight path is right over Danvers, and Boston flight path is right over Danvers. You, I'm sure you're aware, uh, every day we have the jets way up there, but you can still hear them. Can you imagine what it's gonna be like when something like that gets down to right. 5,000, 8,000 feet? Uh, well, uh, let, let me just continue for a second here. Uh, the airport is currently embedded into our residential neighborhoods and is no longer surrounded by farmlands and open fields that we were looking at. Good neighbor policies have been demanded by the affected residents for the past 50 years with no success. There have been some policies that have been identified and implemented. However, those policies now are being ignored. Beverly Airport has totally ignored these requests. Several incidents, accidents 
have been reported and have affected the safety and quality of life in our neighborhoods. The residents of our community, specifically Beverly, Danvers, and Wenham, have established their homesteads during the past 50 years, and their input must be included in the master planning effort. And, and I'm getting to back to the master plan because that is what's on the table right now. Uh, there are three alternates that have been identified. David, if we can show alternate one, two, and three after that. Here's the alternate, alternative one, which is the uh, maintain existing conditions, basically leave it alone as it is, 5,001 feet, and that's adequate according to the users of the airport to support their activities at the moment. Well, that's, that's one of the questions that really, uh, as far as I can see, hasn't been discussed or brought up. Why are they making the changes? Do they feel that they have to expand to keep the airport a, a, into Operational, existence? yes. The, the reason is, is that the business is providing them fees and, uh, you know, landing fees and takeoff fees and, and uh, jet fuel for the facilities that are located on the west side of Danvers, uh, of the airport. And now what we're seeing is this is one of the alternatives, which is adequate for what they have right now. But what they're looking at is a 20-year plan ahead of them. And what their expectations are is by attracting the new version jets and uh, business jets, they will be able to expand the services at the airport and employ additional couple of people maybe. But what they want to do is they want to extend the length to 5,601 feet. That allows them to bring in the jets. Absolutely. They, the jets are already landing there, so they yes. have the adequate space. The problem is, is that they don't have the emergency uh, landing speed in case some pilot messes up and, and lands into the bushes. Let's go to alternate two. This is one as is. Alternative two is the one where they want to extend the runway by 300 feet towards Danvers and 300 feet, which is the maximum they can go on the Beverly side on the east side of the airport, which has all of the industrial facilities, if you notice, at the bottom. Danvers has the facilities that are at the bottom center of the airfield next to the wetlands. And that's where all the fuel is stored. That's where all the fuel dispensing equipment is. Is that on the right side of this print? What is? The Danvers side. The Danvers side is on the bottom center going towards the bottom. That's towards Danvers. Okay, so the airstrip is? Is Danvers to Beverly. You know, Beverly is on the right-hand side and okay. Danvers is on the, the left-hand left side. side. Now, you look at the proximity of the residential properties that are just on the other side of the wetlands. Uh, they're, they're in their living rooms. So the jets take off from the left side to the right because that's where they rev up the engines and that's where the noise is going to be coming from. So you go to alternate three, which is the maximum that they would like to extend because that's, they claim that this is what's required for the safe operation according to the FAA. And FAA is the ruling authority on this particular subject. So if we go back to alternate two, David, uh, that is the bone of contention in regards to what's going on. The primary objective of the master plan is to obtain 
the $20 million grant that has been promised by the FAA. And currently, the application is in process for obtaining that grant. The FAA incentivizes the improvement and expansion of small local regional airports by investing our tax revenue. This is coming from our pockets. The master plan proposal is focused to increase the availability of air facilities for increase of commercial use of airfields. So what I, I, I went through this uh, two weeks ago on the program, but I think the, the key things to the master plan that is being proposed is expansion of the runways on both ends by 600 feet, 300 feet on either end. Beverly Airport has already been functioning as an overflow for Logan Airport. They have volunteered to allow this airport to be used for a small aircraft, not the, the big jets. I mean, they, they can't S land. Small jets. Air. Small jets. Occasionally, they still go in. Yeah, encroachment into Danvers the two football field lengths added to the end of the runways. Length of the runway expansion and future expansions lead to larger and noisier planes. We are already experiencing the jets that are flying according to what the airport manager has announced. And what she has announced is that uh, Beverly Airport plant master plan runway expansions are already inviting new and more intense jet traffic to our neighborhoods. Her plan is to uh, have uh, commercial flights come in to take commuters or passengers to Nantucket, to Martha's Vineyard, to New York City, like you were saying earlier. And the thing is that Henscom Field is just down the road at uh, uh, Route 128, and they are advertising like heck on the radio in regards to the flights that they are offering. So I don't know how this thing is going to materialize, but this is the horse before the, the, the cart before the horse right now because they are assuming that this master plan is going to be adopted. And one of the things that we have is that we don't know what is the status of the master plan because the uh, meetings of the commissioners have basically ended three months ago. We haven't seen a meeting for uh, three months now. And what they're waiting for is for everybody to get tired of complaining about it and sending out information uh, to the airport commissioners. They don't want to hear it. So well, what who I Who makes the decision? To what? To expand. That's the question. The, the manager is the one that's expanding now because she has put this master plan in play. But somebody with, must have to improve it. The state well, that's or, the question. Or the federal government? Or the uh, the FAA is in cahoots already with the airport because what they have promised them is a $20 million cost of expanding the runways and improving the taxiways. Well, if they're, they're involved and the public here who is concerned <coughs> about this should be contacting their federal reps. And this is where this uh, effort has led us to the uh, meetings with Sally Kearns, uh, Senator Lovely, uh, I've sent and, and uh, other individuals have sent letters to Seth Moulton, who's a congressman because of the FAA, because that's a federal agency. And what we need to do is decide on what quality of life do we really want in the town of Danvers, because that's where the traffic is uh, being started from, and that's where the engines are revved up. We need to contact Congressman Seth Moulton. And I have, I have a uh, contact information list that I have prepared, 
and this is to contact the Federal uh, Aviation Administration, FAA, and it is, this is the Federal Aviation Administration Noise Ombudsman, and he has a telephone number at 781-238-7400. Uh, and there's an email for him or her, 9-ane-noise at faa.gov. So this is contact information that you should use to relieve the pressure on the uh, airport so we can live in peace. The other uh, contact information that I have uh, identified is Seth Moulton's office. He is your congressman for this area. And he has been receptive. Uh, his his uh, regional director, Norm Abbott, is the regional director for Seth Moulton in Salem. And they're at 21 Front Street, Salem, Massachusetts. The telephone number to uh, Norm Abbott, and he's going to hate me for this, but it's 978-831-2867. So if you need this information f for any purpose in the future, you can always contact me and get this uh, activity uh, to save your neighborhood, basically. Well, from those, are the, those are the people that you should be contacting. That's right. And, and our state representative and senator and the Board of Selectmen have really no control over this. So what we need to do is uh, master plan future steps. Danvers BVY and commissioners are not uh, re representing the community at large. Mayor Cahill, he has been distanced himself to the point where he's not available. He is the one that's running for re-election right now in Beverly. And he is the one that appoints the manager and uh, the, the, the city. Uh, comm uh, commissioners are appointed by the city of Beverly. Mayor Cahill must get involved to represent the public interest of all communities at large. Neighbors must continue to pressure possibly by organizing. And I have had a couple of slogans that I put together. Save our quality of life. Stop the BVY runway. No jet runway needed. Let us live in peace. No more noise, please. I'll make placards up and maybe what we should do is go to the east side of the airport where the management team is and attend one of their meetings that maybe they'll have, maybe not. So contact all relevant politicians to step up and finally represent these constituents. Unless you do something and this takes place, you're going to have a complete disaster noise-wise. And, and it's, it's already happening. And it's going to be continuous. That's right. So. That's the segment that I wanted to get across. And David, if you can put up the uh, contact information for the ombudsman in uh, Washington again, uh, that is a good contact that we should use to our advantage. So now that we have completed segment one, we're running out of time, John. I told you this is going to fly. but. What I wanted to introduce, at least introduce at this stage, a segment in regard to the school committee and their uh, involvement with the uh, development of our childhood, children's education, basically. And one of the things is I attended a meeting on August 23rd at the school committee meeting, and I understand there will be another one coming up on this coming Monday. The 
Well, let me just read this piece. Um, the inability of our Danvers Health Director to provide proper statistics and only repeat the general state provided statistics leads me to believe that Danvers does not have a problem with the infections. <laughs> That's for later. Danvers does not have a problem with infections, but a problem with the control. What are the actual counts of infections in Danvers? How many of those infections are in the student population? What are the true statistics? The town and the health director is now using chapter 111, section 122, regulations relating to nuisance. Examinations as the basis for these actions. The school committee must def defend our students from such rules, which are not based on law, but on personal interpretation and guidance. But that's what they do. Well, this, this is the, our bureaucrats in both the, the town, the state, and the federal government, specifically through the health departments that are being used now as the whipping boy, are using that to control our population. But that's the job. But recently, listen to this. Recently, the governor has removed himself from imposing restrictive actions because the past actions taken were not legal and directly impacted our freedoms. The governor now wants to use local community boards to continue the state's illegal actions. He has now invoked the Board of Education to promote his illegal actions. How are they illegal? They are recommendations. Now they're trying to enforce them as law. There, it's not through the legisla legislative process. It's true guidance that they are providing. When will the Danvers School Committee declare our independence from these restrictions and the control of freedoms of our students and parents? Parents do not want any more physical constraints on their children. These changes are happening for the last 18 months. But you elect the school committee to make decisions, and this is what they're doing. Well, listen to this. At that meeting, the school committee, in their uh, listening to the parents that attended, there, was, there were probably 30 or 40 parents that attended the meeting, and the school committee was going to take a vote whether to impose the masks on our students or not, but for some reason, they decided that it may not be a good idea, so they decided not to decide. <laughs> so th this is our political process in this town. The, the reason, I understand, and uh, they were afraid of the Board of Education coming out with a dictate to mandate masks, and they did one day later. So the school committee was, was not even involved in this decision. What they're doing is they're imposing these masks on our students, which are unhealthy in a way. And the problem is that they do not want to take responsibility for their actions. But are they unhealthy? Absolutely. That has been advertised all over the place. How do you know? Different studies have been conducted. And different studies have been conducted that have come up with a different opinion. The, the, you, we're going back to our original discussion in regard to masks. <laughs> masks have been uh, found to be inconclusive in controlling the... Some uh, studies. Some studies. And some studies have not. The problem is, is that we're under this control of our bureaucrats, whether they're state, federal, or town, <coughs> that do not want us to live our normal lives. So, that's my opinion, 
and but, I stand by it, John. But that that may create worse uh, health problems. John, you and uh, Pat was a teacher. Ellie was a teacher. And they have gone to class. They have come out from class with all kinds of viruses that have been happening in September, October, and November. Every year, the kids carry the viruses. The flu virus, their cold virus, or whatever else they have. So what are we trying to do? I think I personally believe that this is control of our population. But that's my opinion, and we're, I stand by it. We're trying to make the children healthier. We're, uh, yes, but th then why didn't we do that for the flu? Why didn't we do that for any other virus? This is... Uh, School committee members need to fo refocus their activities to educating our students and not on controlling the social uh, aspects of our school population. What are we afraid of? The China virus or the retaliation by the health department and teachers unions? The parents must take back their rights and resume the role of bringing up their children. School committees must rely on the input by parents who entrust their children to your care. One of the things that was discussed at the school committee meeting was that they were going to take a survey of the parents whether they want their children to wear masks or not. And according to what I heard at the meeting, there was a 60% no, 40% yes to wear the masks. Well, listen to the parents. Where is our independence? Are we part of the uh, state school board of education? Then why do we need the school committee at all? We should fire them all. We elect them, they make the decisions. They don't make any decisions. That's part of the problem. Well, that's... <laughs> they decide not to decide. So, well, we, we got through a portion of this, but I have another segment in regard to the response that I received to my uh, email to the school committee. And I received it from, uh, from our chairman but we'll get to that next time. Uh, I think we're running close to, uh, you know, end of the show. And what I like to do is we need to, uh, September 23rd, on Thursday, September 23rd, we will have the next Topics of the Town News. And uh, I want to thank you for joining me today. And... Uh, David, if you can put the last clip on there, I would appreciate it. And this is a clip that I found from Ernest Hemingway. And one of the things that I like to present to the Board of uh, Selectmen and to the school committee is courage is grace under pressure. So let's live up to our elected officers and rely on our parents and residents to clue you in of what's really going on in our town. <laughs> thank you for being here. Good John, luck. thank you.